today. This is the first in a three-part series uh, that's entitled, I Ran Away to Join the Circus. Um, now, if you're a kid from Iowa, you've got a notion of who this is. This is the poor, stranded young woman. Um, maybe she lives in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, she just has to get out of Iowa and see the, the bright lights of the big city. Um, but our guest today is not our guest today is Margie Geiger, a trained, trained in ballerina, a native New Yorker who left the bright lights of the big city and opted instead to come to Sarasota in the 1940s, which must have been a major cultural shock. And we will talk about all of that. But Beautiful she went, little city. She went on to become a renowned aerialist. Um, she's now um, also a painter and a sculptor and a beloved teacher and mentor. So please join me uh, in welcoming Margie Geiger to Collecting Recollections. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the problems that, uh, with Collecting Recollections for me is our guests arrive and we do the sound check and then we start talking and I get all of the good stories before the program begins. So I tried not to do that today because I don't think in an hour we're going to get all the stories in, are never, we? Never, never. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the notion of running away and joining the circus. But I think that story begins in the ballet studios in New York. Very much so. I think I had my, maybe seen a circus once when I was very, very tiny. I might possibly have seen my husband work, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Joe, you didn't impress me. <laughs> All I remember, I think, was something about cotton candy, my husband being older than I. But no, uh, my training uh, was Russian training. In New York City, we had a lot of the Russian emigres, and they had wonderful studios. And uh, I found myself at one but I was a very late starter. 14 is late to start that kind of training if you want to be a dancer. So I, um, I was there and I crammed in much, much, much within to three years before I started taking auditions. And you auditioned uh, for two enormous. Yes, yes I did. I, uh, I auditioned for the Radio City Music Hall, and to my knowledge, I was accepted, but uh, there was no vacancy in the ballet corps for, for the smaller girls. So my, my name was on the list for vacancy. Uh, at some point in 44, unbeknownst to my teachers, they usually arrange these things, but I didn't know that, I was very young. And I auditioned for the Metropolitan Opera Ballet Company. And lo and behold, uh, I passed the auditions. But I have to tell you a funny story. I, they were all the students, so the people auditioning, all in black. And I came in with no tights, pink toe shoes, and a little orchid top. So I stood out like a sore thumb. Had very high extension. Uh, at that time, in those years, we had no male partners because they were all in the army. So I had no training for these pas de deux, they call them. So I have to tell you, we entered up in the center. I had a partner, and we were supposed to do supported pirouettes. I was so frightened. I was so frightened. I was scared straight. <laughs> and I couldn't do less than three, and they thought they had a child genius on their hand. <laughs> well, I was accepted, which was a shock. They started with Aida. I had no character training. I was strictly classical. I found myself at sea. I got frightened. And uh, I didn't know where to turn for help. And I, I withdrew. A sad story. But look, at, in the end, it worked out wonderfully. But Mr. Novikov was, was the head of, and he was kind to tell me, if you leave, you will never be a dancer. Wasn't he right? However, <laughs> all of that has made my being on Ringling possible and made my whole shape, my whole life following. 
So from the Metropolitan Opera Ballet to the circus, yes. how did that happen? I had a telephone call, and it was somebody that asked me, uh, would I come and audition? Uh, this was for Ringling. They wanted to put on a ballet number that year. And would I come down? Would I consider it? So I said, oh. So I did. <laughs> and um, I had no list. I had a private audition because I missed the big one. And uh, being with my training, was, you know, it was OK, acceptable. So there was a discussion. Well, you know, I still had pigtails and braces and glasses. And he said, well, she'll be all right with flowers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out what they were going to do with me. So uh, lo and behold, I was uh, accepted, and I had a contract for Ringling. And uh, in 1945, you know, wages were still very, very, very low. And uh, I walked away with quite a nice contract, and I got extra for doing toe work. So uh, that was my initial uh, entrance to Ringling. How did that news go down? with y your, your parents. I mean, they had paid for you to go to ballet school. You were going to dance on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, and now you told them instead? <laughs> well, my mother was ready to murder me after the ballet thing, of course. <laughs> she was ready to strangle me. So, uh, but my mother was a very flexible person. I think she would have enjoyed this to no end. I, I know she would have. But um, uh, my grandfather probably stroked out. I don't know. That was not acceptable. <laughs> but um, no, it, uh, I, I had no problems in that. Yeah. Uh, it it uh, just kind of flowed along like some kind of everything was laid out and planned for me. I have, I've had all my life had little angels up here. It <laughs> had to be. One thing just floated into the other. Some people have talent and everything and nothing good happens for them. Everything was open to me, That's always. Wonderful. So you got on the train? Yes. Came that to was, Sarasota? Yes, we sat up all night coming to Sarasota. There were about eight of us, if I remember. I'm not sure. And uh, we arrived in Sarasota and stayed in a little hotel down on Main Street, which is long gone, in this little tiny town with Main Street. It's the end of it was at Osprey Avenue. <laughs> and there was the old Five Points. Uh -huh. And down you went down the main down to the, this little wood shack way out on the pier. That was City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> the airport was a Quonset hut <laughs> way out in the wilderness. <laughs> the hospital was up on cement blocks, a small building. Uh, all, uh, further out, you know, from Southgate, that was all orange groves. Lido Beach was this gorgeous, beautiful beach. We had the cabanas in semicircle, the pavilion with the pool, the dance hall that was all destroyed. Beautiful. So the first thing we did when we got here was go out to the beach and get sunburned <laughs> straight from New York. And then, of course, that got worse. But I have to tell you, before we talk about the stages, was how we got out to the quarters, which is fascinating. Winter quarters, yeah. Yes, that was way out, which is today is a big housing development. But we went down to the corner of Osprey, and that was Smack's drive-in at that time, which was quite lively because the army was still here. And uh, we got what they called the show bus, which was an old bus. And it picked up all the performers to take them out to the quarters to start rehearsals. And uh, so we got ourselves together and managed to get out and uh, started, which at that time was a huge, wonderful winter quarters. And the layout for the rehearsals were the stages and the rings, as you would have seen under the tent or in Madison Square Garden. But it was wide open, and we rehearsed eight hours a day in that broiling hot sun, sunburn. <laughs> did you ever, um, did you ever look back? I mean, did you ever 
think, what have I done? Never. Oh, <laughs> no, I was, I was up in seventh heaven. So I, how many people were, I mean, when you, got to, when you got to winter quarters for the very first time, I mean, oh, it all was I shocking. know about winter quarters, I watch The Greatest Show on Earth every single time it's on television and wherever I can. That's all I know about it is the Hollywood Oh, it was wonderful. Version. Was it like that? Oh, yes. When you came in, there were islands. There were big chimps over here, an island with little, uh, uh, little I can't think of the name right now, little creatures floating all around, carrying on. And uh, there was a huge building way over, and that was for wardrobe and canvas and so forth. And a lot of barns, horse barns, elephant barns. And over here was the, the layout and the stages, as we had to use for rehearsals. And way over there was the cookhouse. And at that time, they had hanging fly things. <laughs> and uh, so, but the thing was, when we got out there as people with no knowledge of circus, they, they started the roll call. And uh, Joe will end it, Helen will end it, Carl will end it. Edith Valenda, Martha Valenda, oh, but, okay. who's that? You know, and then Rapinski, this Rapinski, that Rapinski. And you know, I mean, it was like an ocean of people. Who are they? We had no idea. And they were all related? Yes, mostly, yes. Yeah, they, <laughs> sometimes in the act, like with my husband, he was not a relative, but he was with the act so long, they thought he was Valenda. That was not his real name. So, uh, it, but it was a shock. And then as we started rehearsal, up on the platform raised there was this gentleman up there, turned out to be Robert Ringling, who was the, the big man then. And next to him seemed a little man, seemed kind of a top hat, very, seemed a little bit crotchety. We couldn't figure out. It was the, the great equestrian director, is Fred Bradner, and uh, who was, uh, one of the great people connected with Ringling. Robert Ringling, uh, for those of you who don't know, is Charles Ringling's son, um, next door neighbor here. Um, so how many dancers were there? On, onto the circus lot, on, into Winter Quarters comes how many ballet dancers? Well, there weren't many ballet dancers. They yeah. were a small group, and, I, and they were not terribly good, frankly. <laughs> they weren't that well trained. <laughs> they hadn't been trained by the Russians. No, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, uh, all these numbers were made up of performers from other acts were also, and they're plus girls that were hired in New York yeah. to to do the ballet. And so t tell me about that, that ballet performance. You, how long did you rehearse it and, and I mean, was it? Well, we, uh, we started, what, I, I don't know, we must have been there a couple of weeks. I don't, I don't remember now, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, except I got parboiled. But um, <laughs> what, what happened with me was that as a dancer, uh, as with performing, you practice, it's constant practice. So between takes, on the stages, I used to go, I got my toe shoes and went out and started doing my bar work and practicing. Well, Robert Ringling was interested in the arts. He himself was an opera singer and he loved the arts. So uh, also as a business and a promoter, he's, he's looking to see talent, ambition. You know, as a teacher, I do the same thing. So. Uh, I came to his attention along with a young man who's here right now also was a Jack LeClaire. Uh, and we were both running neck and neck with ambition, talent, and, and the good uh, happening that we were, you know, we were pushed and allowed it to grow under Mr. Ringling, Robert. You're still running neck and neck with ambition and talent. Very much so. <laughs> yes, we're, we're hanging up to each other. <laughs> we both just celebrated our 89th birthdays. And uh, <laughs> we have some wild times together. We were together for years. We did our, in 1946, we both did our first aerial acts. He was trained by Wolfgang Roth, who trained Hedy Lalage, the greatest, one of the greatest ring performers ever. I was trained by Joseph Geiger, Walenda, if you want to call him, from the High Wire Act. So that, uh, and uh, we worked six numbers each show, 
uh, went to eat and then came back in practiced and then did another show that night. How flexible was the world of circus? I mean, you came as a dancer. Yes. You did the dance. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing, you're up in the air. Oh, uh, I worked. I wanted it. I wanted it so badly. And Joe very kindly started to help me, and he used to hang me on a little bar uh, because I had no muscle. I was two legs walking around. And then he'd teach me just to come down slow gradually, and then he'd really get rough and then start making me pick my legs up and down. Oh, but he was European, and so I had, again, European training. But he was gentle. He wasn't, he was really tough in so that So if sense. you wanted to do something oh, else yes. in the circus, oh, and you oh, worked, Oh, I wanted to go it. up. It, it, to me, it was, you know, I don't know where the ballet went, but I saw that, and oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> well, I think all Ball ballerinas want to be able to fly. I mean, they, 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 they <laughs> well, want to... yes, they all want to be swan, swan queen sailing off somewhere. <laughs> but so, but I might it, it sort of got sidetracked in a sense because in that same year we had the wonderful Alice in Wonderland spec, and uh, before Baltimore, Alice left. Uh, I think her husband came home from overseas or something, the war was over. And uh, Robert Ringling asked me if I wanted to do Alice. And I said, yes. I don't know where I got the courage to do that. So I went in, and I, no, nobody told me what to do outside of the, the few words that I had to say. And uh, I was the first in and last out, as actually for the whole spec. And uh, I danced on the stage, I said the piece, and then I danced with him at Kelly on stage, and I made him do a pas de deux with me. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was having a ball. Spec I, is short for the spectacle. That's the spectacle. That's the big parade. We just spec. And every year they have one, you know, and they have a different theme. So that was the Alice. And we had this glorious swan float. I have to tell you about the float. It was huge. And uh, up on the, the beautiful swan head was a crown. And there was some plumbing up there because there was supposed to be a fountain <laughs> going. And the swan got big in the back, you know, and up there was a throne for Alice that later on she would climb. So the swan would go around, or it was supposedly go all the way around the track and the lights were shining. and. Uh, uh, but as, as I finished on the stage, I ran out to get on there and get my crown and my fur cape and get up on the top of the sitting there, and I'm throwing kisses to the audience all the way around and the plumbing. Well, the plumber is working, trying to get the plumbing to work, and it wouldn't, and all of a sudden, all hell broke loose, and I was drowned. So we had a terrible storm, and they threw hay down, and in the back door, they had a ditch because of all the rain coming down. So as the swan came around, and I'm sitting way up and on the back, and I turn around to throw a last kiss to the swan, to the audience, and hit the ditch. And the last thing the audience saw was Alice going three feet and disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> but life was made up of all kinds of things. It's wonderful work. It's hard work. You have, sometimes you work under the, the belly in the canvas, you know, where it's heavy rain, so they come in with long poles and they poke a hole. Well, that's right where you have to work. <laughs> it's all right, you just keep working. So do you remember your, your very first, I mean, you came to Winter Quarters, you learned your, your act, your dance. Um, do you remember the very first performance with the circus? Oh, New York City was Madison Square Garden. I mean, it was, you know, it was so, it was still so new to me and so great. And uh, we had the, uh, it was a ballet number, beautiful, and we came out with these wonderful things. So we came out sailing out into this wonderful music up onto the stage and took a great big thing and down I went. <laughs> <laughs> so my debut, I'm sorry, was sitting on, on the stage. <laughs> So they had put a, a ring, a carpet, brand new canvas carpet on the stage, and it was like a skating rink. Well, the carpet disappeared. I didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a good choice. Um, 
Well, the following year, then, I was with Emmett again. I was the dancing doll in Toyland. That was the big spec the following year. So Emmett couldn't get rid of me either. So <laughs> everything was wide open for me. So you became an aerialist? Yes, in 1946. And uh, trapeze or? No, it, was, it looked like an anchor. And uh, it, uh, Carl had orders from the top to use me, and so he put me with Helen. My first aerial partner is no less as Helen Walenda herself. <laughs> how, how good can you get? So uh, Jackie LeClaire was in another number. Mary Jane is going to be here. She was, it was an aerial display. So I, my first year was with a double act with Helen Walenda on this anchor act. Wow. And then um, the Roman rings, right? Big Burn. You did the Roman rings? Yes, yes, but that, not that year. Yeah. I started with those. And it's hard work for a woman, very hard. The aerial acts are. Ro rings are rings hard, are. yeah. <laughs> and why, why, why the change on that? Well, uh, the first one was an act that I was put in with Helen. You know, it wasn't my choice, although I, I loved it. Uh, it was great for me. And it looked pretty. I had to write up the, in uh, Seventeen magazine on that one. But uh, no, I chose the rings. I, Hedy Lalage was there, wonderful, wonderful woman. And I admired it so much. This, you know, you, you admire somebody, you emulate them. So, and uh, Joe was my teacher, and he was experienced in all this. So he, he started teaching me, and that's what we decided. And then Joe became more than your teacher. Hmm? Joe became more than your teacher. Yes, by the end of 1946, I stole him. I, I married him. <laughs> <laughs> so he was my teacher. He's a wonderful teacher. He's a very gentle person. And of course, he worked so hard all those years uh, uh, with Carl. He was the original Walendas way back in 24, retired in 49 but had to go back and help Carl through vacancies to help him again with the seven. So, uh, it, wonderful, wonderful stories uh, uh, all through, but I had every advantage possible. Yeah, and then how long were you with the Ringling Show? I stayed with, we, in 1946, at the end of the season, uh, Carl Walenda left Ringling, the contract was up, and, uh, Joe was still in the act, and they were going to do the seven. That was the year they first performed the seven-person pyramid. So I left Ringling. I was his, Joe's wife. So we went out with Carl. He started his own show, which unfortunately failed. And it was a wonderful from some of the best acts from Ringling, but it failed. So the tough season that followed, Joe and I stayed about more than halfway through, and then we left. So Joe and I went back to Ringling in 1948, uh -huh. okay. and that was my last season then with Ringling. And then did you perform after that? Oh, yes, yes, oh, yeah. In 49, we stayed home. Uh, well, he went to Cuba. That's where he got the gold medal and retired. But anyhow, no, in 1950, we had pretty much gotten, I learned the finish trick, and got the whole back together. And uh, I was up in uh, Detroit, and uh, of course, in 1947, that's where I fell on my head. But in 1950, I filled in for somebody that uh, was hurt or something. And uh, in, in just taking part of the act in, uh, the, through that, they, uh, they hired me for the following season for, for, for the center. I have to back you up because to, to, to some, us non-circus folk, you're using some shorthand here. Um, <laughs> the finish act, the finish trick? Oh, yes. Uh, I learned uh, it was a very difficult trick called one-arm swings. You might hear, if you've ever heard of Lillian Leithsoul used to do them, and uh, the great Lalage. Uh, it took me forever. It, very difficult to learn. And it's a, it's a tough, very tough uh, you hang by one arm and you pick your legs, you get a tempo and you go. It's almost like walking a circle. And usually you do anywhere from 50 to 80. You can do lots more, but it bores the devil out of the audience if you do too many, I think. <laughs> but uh, it, it, uh, I, I finally, when I retired, basically I quit because it was just 
tore up my wrist so badly all the time. In Hawaii, I was open all the way around doing four shows a day, and I had blood poisoning, and I said, that's it. <laughs> so that was the finish trip. And then you also, you fell? Yes, in 1947, uh, I went up with Carl on the winter days, and Joe wouldn't go. And he wouldn't, so Carl wouldn't let me out of it, so I went with the family and uh, did several acts. And uh, I did the double act with another lady, and I did a, a, what they call a breakaway. And uh, I would be hanging from way up on the top. She's in a foot loop upside down, and she's putting a loop that's on her hand and putting it around my foot, you see. So my feet uh, are down where her head is, see. So when she says go, then I let go, and there's that big drop, and I end up hanging by one foot, and then they let us down. Well, we were late, and... Um, I remember turning around, that's all I know. The next thing I know, I'm on the ground and they're picking me up six men to a blanket and I knew what that meant. So that was my great, uh, I stole a show. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean, see, everybody suffered uh, much more than I did. I had a back fracture, I, but I was just worried about my foot being a dancer. You know, I was just terrified, but uh, it, it, uh, it was, pushed back together. I had six, seven shrine doctors. They finally had to decide, you know, only one can handle <laughs> So anyhow, uh, that was the first week in February. And by Good Friday, around Easter time, the orthopedic doctor came to visit with one of the doctors to the show. And I had to run and get my toe shoes and show him, you know, and he couldn't believe it. He thought I wasn't going to walk, ever walk right or something. And he could get back on point? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But they told the same thing to my husband. They're always telling you, you're never going to work again, because he pulverized his heel in an accident. So, uh, but uh, he worked for years holding those pyramids. But earlier, you were telling me you did witness one, one terrible and tragic flaw. Oh, my fall. first year in 1945, the most beautiful performer, uh, uh, Frank and Victoria Torrance, did a beautiful beautiful perch act in the middle, way up in the ceiling. And uh, I was watching from a stairwell. I had time between numbers. It was just a fluke. And uh, the other two acts finished and went out, and they were getting ready to do the finish trick, which she did a beautiful thing when they would get in a position and they would let them down all the way from the ceiling, you know. Well, I remember, and she did this thing, threw her arms back and just went. They had jerked the ropes. One of the banners from the ceilings got into the pulley block, and they jerked, and she went down. And uh, Victoria was killed, uh, which was a terrible shock. But you know, the show goes on. But uh, it, uh, it's still tough. <laughs> I. I think every time I hear one of those stories, that's what both impresses me, though, and mystifies me. I think if I had fallen, if I had seen someone fall to their death, and then if I had fallen myself, I'm not sure I would ever go do that again. But um, no, the show goes on. They all do. They go back. I was practicing with the, with the cast and everything on. No. <laughs> I mean, you... I, I don't know that you could go through all that if you really didn't want to be there. I mean, let me tell you, there are times when you sure didn't want to be there. You were tired or you didn't feel well. But it's a tough life. But it, you have chosen that. And that's what you, either if you were born into that through generations, that's what you do. Or you chose it because that's what you want. Yeah, it's um, and and no, you. And I think particularly, you know, the when you were doing it under canvas and with the trains, it must it must have been exhausting to oh, just keep yes. going. Oh yes, oh yes. How long was the show out? I mean, once you left Sarasota, how long was the show out before you came back? Oh, Ringling. Yeah. 
oh, at like November, it was, and it was cold. We would be working in Carolinas, and let me tell you, under canvas, that was tough. It was cold. It was cold, and then oh, he came yeah. back to Sarasota. Then came back home. A lot of people, of course, had houses here. They lived here uh, or whatever. So uh, it was always wonderful to come home. And the St. Martha's Church, they, they, the priests, they would all come out to welcome us, come back home. And when we left, the priest and the boys would come out and, and say blessings for the train because this was a circus town at that time, very much so. It was a very small town, so beautiful. And uh, it, it, um, it, it was circus town. Yeah. So Sarasota's been your home since... Since, not, yes, I bought a house in 1951, but I've been here since 1945. So that's... For a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's I'm 70, a, 70... I'm a cracker now. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I'm transplanted cracker. I can't tell you how small and how beautiful the beach is, Siesta. Now, Siesta Beach was just a few houses back there with the Australian pines. No hotels, none of that. It was just so beautiful. In 44, a storm had hit, though, and some, there was some damage. Uh, at the Walenda house, uh, it knocked an oak tree down or something wow. like that, and poor Gunther got, it was full of poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Saras oh, Sarasota is blessed. We seem to be under some umbrella to protect us from storms. From the hurricanes. Have we ever, really? Yeah. So uh, when did you stop circus performing? Oh, I finally, uh, I resigned, I, I quit in 1961 in E.K. Fernandez in Hawaii. And we were out there on Diamond Head in the tent going up and down like a yo-yo with the wind. <laughs> And uh, we had come home from, uh, well, I was two years in Australia with Worth Circus over there. And uh, that was a bit of a trial. I, I wrote a journal about that because it's kind of wild. <laughs> that was a, a circus company in Australia? Yes, Worth Circus was famous, yes. It had deteriorated through the years, but it had been a great, great show. Tell us the scariest story of Worth Circus. You've got me intrigued. About Worth? Yeah, you said it was quite an experience. It was, yes. <laughs> we were not prepared. I was used to working the big shrine shows, Ringling, you know, these are huge. So we got there and uh, number one, we, we were dressed improperly. Uh, I had winter clothing on. Well, it's reversed. It was hot, it was summer. We didn't understand the money, pounds, guineas, pence, we had no idea. Went out to the zoo, we got a meat pie <laughs> milkshake, a little bitty. Now, it was a kind of cultural shock. And then the trains, we, uh, they came to pick us. Well, the hotel was almost like a flop house. <laughs> you had to have a hotel to have a bar. That, that was what that, at that time. See, this uh -huh. is 1954. So, and we had just come off living like queens on the Swedish freighter and you couldn't have eaten or ever lived better. So the contrast was dreadful. So we, um, and I still dressed at that time. So uh, we were picked up to go to the show, to see the show. And uh, of course it's all on the wrong side of the road. So I'm not, uh, I'm, think I'm going to be killed because we're driving on the wrong side of the road, of course, which is the right thing. So anyhow, uh, and it, it was so small. And the music was a little broken down, beat up wagon, looked like it rolled over three or four times with a fellow sitting up there with a drum and a phonograph record. <laughs> uh, and it, it kept getting, you know, from bad to worse. And of course, all the acts there were waiting to see the American acts, you know. Well, it, uh, then we were introduced to the train and, and the platform over here with the elephant dung, <laughs> <laughs> harnesses where the elephants had been there. And uh, here were these, you see, they had the European carriages where uh, they were doors on each side and your compartment ran right straight through. So being all dressed up and everything, looking like a million dollars, I got a double 
a double roomette or what. <laughs> the only thing is, in transit, you had to, you couldn't go outside to go from one to the other. You you upended over the seat to get into the other part. It was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but but I have two other clowns were uprooted for Joe and I, and and my friends were hunters and they had their trunks and rifles and everything else and they were in a small one. So it, it pays to dress, you see. Yeah. So, <laughs> the moral of the, the story. Show, the show had some wonderful acts, you see, uh, and uh, some European imports and so forth. But it was a big cultural shock. Traveling on the trains, one train had eight wheels, uh, eight sides on each wheel, I'm sure. And uh, wow. <laughs> we, but going to New Zealand, I love the New Zealand. So, so your career took you ar around the world and... Yeah, I, I would like to have gone to Europe. We had a possibility of Japan, but it was so close to World War II, I was still, I still had a bomb <laughs> yeah. and I didn't want to be away from my family. And then South Africa, I wouldn't go because a couple of the... Mau Mau was very active and I was so scared of them, I wouldn't go. Right. So, uh, but I, I was uh, elsewhere, I traveled, and, and how wonderful. Yeah, so you're back in Sarasota, you're no longer a circus performer. Oh, I had wild times. That was the, <laughs> that was the, the, the second journey. Um, before, I started painting at a, one of the art studios here. This was a great art colony, and great. And uh, it was mostly uh, portrait work and so forth, which I, I could always draw, and I learned how to paint at the time. So uh, I, I started, and then I had commissions, and uh, my house was full of paintings. They're under the bed, they're in the closet, they're hanging on, they're driving crazy. And I have paintings out that I don't remember. Uh, but uh, then I, I quit, but in the meantime, I started helping with a friend with, with the ballet again. She had a, a teacher that had a school over in Bradenton. Let me tell you, ballet keeps you going. She was 109 and 20 days before she left this earth. So that's what ballet does for you. <laughs> Do you still follow the ballet? Oh, yes. Oh, I love, we just had the wonderful Cuban Ballet School open two years ago, and they had a performance here just a month or so ago. they absolutely wonderful. And we have a wonderful ballet company here now. Wonderful. We are on the road to, I think, a major company in a number of years. I really do. I believe that. Do you think any of them are going to run away and join the circus? I don't think so. <laughs> We're going to run away and join the ballet. Yeah. <laughs> but then I took care of the cats. I spent 15 years with... The what? The cats. Pussy cats. cats. Oh. <laughs> yes. I got overly involved with rescue. And uh, I've worked months and months and months and months taking care of kitty cats and getting them adopted. Yeah. So that took up a lot of my life. That's a great story. I'm a, I'm a cat person. I can't, I can't go and get cat food on Saturdays because that's when they have all of them there. And, you know, oh, when you I, already I'll have take food. care of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're wonderful. And we are so in need. And of course, uh, you know, we touch on a subject with cats is the animal situation for circus. Yeah. It's so misconstrued, you know. I have many friends in circus. I love and I work, I work for cats and all animals and I would not have a friend that, that beat or hurt them. I can tell you there are more people on my neighborhood or my street that abuse animals far more than any show person I know. That's, that's not true. You mentioned earlier um, your eye is a teacher. Yes. Tell us about teaching. Oh, yes. I started, um, I never considered myself a teacher. I kind of fell into that like so much else. Uh, they had what we call Sailor Circus. It's still the school circus. And uh, Lou Ann Jacob, Dolly's sister, came home to finish her high school. She had gone out on the road. Uh, so I, I started to help her with a small act. 
I didn't really know that much about trap. She does, but anyhow, we put something together just for that program. She was trapeze artist. Yes. Okay. Yes. Beautiful girl, and uh, she was already on Ringling as a as a ballet girl. See, and um, but she wanted to do more. Now um, later, uh, uh, then Dolly came along. Now Dolly came home. They they were Dolly joined the show with her mother, so the family was intact on the show together instead of being separated. So Dolly wanted to be a performer. She didn't want to be a forty year old showgirl. This was her nineteen beautiful child. So we talked with mom and dad and talked it out and said, leave her home where she can do and learn a proper act. And she's responsible. The neighbors are wonderful. They will look after her. She was a wonderful, disciplined girl. So we made the arrangement, and the family went out on the road, Papa Lou, the great clown, and Dolly stayed home. Every morning, she was out there totally warmed up. To this day, she does a wonderful warm-up long, very good. She would be out there and we went to work. We put the rings up on, on the rigging and started practice. And that went on. Then I went home. I had to go to work. So I had my lunch, went home, back over to work and Joe went back and worked with her. So this went on and she made quite a bit of progress. So uh, it began to get very hot. So I told Dolly, write your dad and say, now. So uh, we, I took time off from my work, and Dolly and I flew up. We went to Washington. Well, first of all, she grew up. She had a beautiful pink suit, and she looked great. We got up to Washington. The Felds were not there. They were on the other unit. So we watched the show, and it looked high, and Dolly's sweating. And I thought, oh, don't tell me you went through all this, and she's afraid of height. <laughs> oh, like, oh no! So anyhow, the next day we come in and uh, they they decided to put her rings up. They told us I'd had nothing to do with it. Well, that caused a rumpus because it was on the far fence flying act and was a blah blah blah. So uh, anyhow, she worked. She went up and practiced, and her dad swung her, and. Uh, I mean, he swung like, I thought, you know, you're going to do loop the loop or something. What <laughs> do you mean? So, powerful. The, the, yeah, because you do a still routine and then you do a swinging routine. So um, then uh, there were only a few people there. See, it was between shows. So the next day we got in, and let me tell you, everybody was there. Word travels very quickly. And so Dolly got nervous, and I said, Dolly, they're your friends. They've known you since you're 13 years old. And I said, just go listen to the music. Do the long, we had two routines. I said, do the long routine. Just listen to the music and let it go. So she worked well. They thought she was going to do this little trap act, and here comes this glorious, beautiful girl doing this beautiful ring act. So she came down, and oh my gosh, you know. So Vicki Eunice, of course, who was a ring performer herself, and she came over, and I said, Vicki, <laughs> I said, you do a different act. You can't do what Dolly does. She can't do what you do. That's totally, you know, they happen to be rings, but they're different acts. And uh, so somebody said, well, who's the teacher? Because I didn't look like a performer anymore. <laughs> so, so anyhow, I had to go back home. She worked in the show that night. Wow. And they had her in the ring, but she didn't want to go. She went on the end ring because she didn't have the finish trick that she wanted yet. So we cooked up one that looked very nice to the public, but it was not a performer's trick. So the performer's trick is one that you can be proud of with other performers. <laughs> it's sometimes it's silly, but that's the way it is. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, within a year or two, she was uh, sent to ring solo on Ringling, let me tell you. And she was invited to Monte Carlo. That's the Olympics of circus. And she got one of the big awards there. And she was again at Monte Carlo and won awards. She's a very great performer. Well, really it sounds is. like you're a very great teacher. <laughs> Yeah. I taught her to break the egg, but she made the fancy omelet. Let's put it that way. Right? <laughs>
Any other memories you would like to share before we wrap it up? Oh, you know, it's so full of wonderful memories. I think it's been the, how, how lucky could I have ever been to fall into this wonderful life who I knew nothing about. It's so full of color. The circus people are wonderful. Somebody has an accident, they're all there to help. You know, uh, uh, the stories. I wish that we had written down or made the copies of Lou Jacobs and Joe Geiger because they were around all those years. The stories from the great Christiani family, all these people years ago, in, for instance, the great Christiani's the writing act, they were in, in Italy and the Wallendas were on the same show. And the Wallendas came to put up their rigging and the Christianis were in the ring practicing. So they waited, the Wallendas, they waited, Joe and Herman, they waited, you know, and said, we got to go in. We, so, so they said, you know, we have to put the rigging up. So they go round and round and round. So finally they got into an, a fight. So Joe ran upstairs to the manager, you know, and he says, oh my God, he said, you didn't hit them. You didn't hit them. This is Italy. They'll throw you in jail and throw the key away. Oh, oh, well, they got it straightened out. <laughs> However, the next engagement was in Germany. So they got, well, Linda says, wait till we get you in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, how can you ever put it into a story. I would talk your head off, I'm sorry. But no. it's a wonderful life, and I'm so happy and so grateful to have been any part of it at all. Well, thank you for, for sharing um, everything that you've shared. Um, I think um, you recently, I, I, I guess it was Dolly's honor in, New, uh, oh. in Washington, but you were honored there too. Do you want to share I don't, with the audience that? <laughs> Yes, we were up in Washington, D.C. Uh, to watch Dolly receive her honors from the National Endowment of the Arts, mind you. That's, wha how can you do better than that? And she was so wonderful. And they, uh, in, in, in receiving her award, she said she honored me by her, as her teacher. And she said, Margie, Margie. And uh, I, we had moved, my friend and I. And so finally, I, I'm sinking down, and my friend says, get up, get up, stand. You know, well, I couldn't. I couldn't find my shoes. <laughs> 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 However, we had dinner in the, under this glorious ceiling in the Library of Congress, no less. And uh, the weather turned badly. So we didn't see much of the great monuments because they were, it, we saw them in taxi rides at the distance going from here to there. But it was a wonderful honor for Dolly, she, and she deserves every bit of it. She's a great performer. She's a great representative of circus. She truly is. But that's, that's all the time we have today. <laughs> this has been wonderful, thank you. Um, we'll be back in two weeks with Mary Jane Miller, and she's going to share her memories of 13 years with the greatest show on earth. Uh, and just when we finish here today, uh, join us for a brief reception across the hall where you can meet Margie. But Margie, there's someone here special for you. Oh. <laughs> Let me get this before I... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, for a chair. <laughs> okay. And here, for people here is my most beautiful. And here, people here is my most beautiful. Oh, I am so blessed to have her in my life. And there's another student that she taught back at Taylor Circus, Kennedy. I think we brought some. Thank you very much.